Okay, so a warm, warm welcome uh, to everybody uh, who's joined us today for our IS Entity Connect session. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Cameron Rafiq. I'm the co-founder and communications director here at the International Society for NTDs. Uh, we're broadcasting live from London. It's an unusually sunny day here and it's slightly warm for December, but a wonderful omen for things to come. Um, it's been an eventful year for all of us. I'm referring really to the COVID-19 situation, with so many of us having to adapt to social distancing. This is our major adaptation ourselves. We started this Connect series about 40 weeks ago now, uh, at the beginning of the first lockdown in March. It's been an unprecedented success. We found that uh, we've got a tremendous reach uh, right now, we've got about 533 registered people online right now in terms of watching this uh, particular uh, uh, webinar. The country spread is huge. I am going to ask you all to give yourselves a uh, you know quick introduction on in terms of the chat box. Just give your name, organization, and country. That would be great. A quick hello, um, and I'll be giving some shout outs later on. Um, it's been a monumental year in terms of COVID, but also a, um, a great year in terms of the struggle against NTDs. Uh, predominantly the uh, ratification by the WHO member states in April of the uh, WHO's consensus-based roadmap to 2030 in terms of the guidelines of how we are going to we're going to combat, we're going to uh, fight against these diseases as a global community, it was ratified back in April uh, by the member states. And on that report, um, giving guidelines until 2030, there were three major shifts in focus that really do need to be emphasized. Um, I think the first of those shifts really was a movement from a pragmatic, uh, pro pragmatic orientation, so uh, really from a measuring impact uh, as action to much more of a, uh, how to put it, impact measure itself. So the impact of uh, interventions to the communities, the real life of the communities affected by NTDs. That's one of the first um, kind of shifts in focus. Another uh, shift, an important shift, was that of moving from vertical disease silos to a much more um, cross uh, multidisciplinary cross-cutting approach, bringing in new platforms, new disciplines, uh, in, in some cases new technologies and new perspectives uh, on disease management and combating uh, particular diseases within the NTD spectrum. And then also uh, well, the final uh, kind of shift was really moving from an external stakeholder outside in uh, approach to much more sovereign led country focus, um, which has meant you know, financing from held at sovereign level and also really uh, a lot more high level political decision making from countries uh, involved in this struggle. All of these things are going to impact the way that we uh, approach NTDs. And I think one of the uh, key areas of that is going to be funding and the way, uh, uh, you know, uh, the way this is uh, approached in terms of NTDs. So we're very honored today to have with us uh, one of the largest funds in this uh, field, the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, the GHIT Fund from Japan. And I'm delighted to welcome to the webinar uh, Dr. Hayato Urabe, the Senior Director in terms of Investment Strategy, Portfolio Development and Innovations from uh, Tokyo, joining us from Tokyo. I can only apologize about the, uh, the, the, uh, how to put it, time difference there. It was very kind of you to join us, Dr. Arabe. And I think, believe in, um, in, in Switzerland, we have from the GHIT Fund, the Senior Director for Investment Strategy Access and Delivery, uh, and that's Isaac Chekwanha. So a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Arabe and to Isaac. Uh, and thank you very much for making time uh, to, to join us today. Hi there. Hi, thank you. Great stuff. Um, we're getting some shout outs uh, in terms of the uh, the people joining the call. So Dr. Eli Karani-Lefol from um, Elk 
Elko Bio Switzerland, Dr. Helena Uliatha from Jakarta, the Ministry of Health Indonesia, um, Dr. Mahdi Borani from uh, the uh, Center for Hayati Diseases in Iran, um, from Bangladesh, Dr. Aftab Udin, we've got uh, Dr. Nebe from uh, Abuja, Nigeria, uh, from Sokoto, Dr. Edieni, Elton Rogozi from the Albanian Institute of Public Health, Dr. Zahid Sulajimani from Albania, a very cross um, cutting, lots of different countries uh, joined on. That's the, one of the beauties of, uh, well, that's one of the uh, positives that we've certainly taken home from this experience in, in Connect. Um, I think we are going to move to uh, the presentation shortly, but I've been asked to show a video that the Global Health um, Innovative Technology Fund, GHIT Fund, have put together about their work in uh, Praziquantel, in the pediatric formulation and their whole kind of uh, involvement in that landscape. So if it's all right with everybody, I'll just, I'm just going to play the video and then we'll move after that, after it finishes, um, into the uh, uh, actual presentation. The Prazi Quantel Pediatric Consortium is a public-private partnership, which is non-profit, actually includes eight partners all over the world. The mission is to develop and register a formulation, innovative formulation of Prazi Quantel. Prazi Quantel is a medicine which is used to treat schistosomiasis. This disease is a worm disease also called Pilarsia or snail fever. It infects uh, millions of people, more than 250 million people are infected in Africa, 26 million children. Every child has the right to grow up healthy and happy. These infections are preventing the development that they should be having, the growth that they should be having. There is a formulation of Praziquantel available for adults and school-age children. The problem with this formulation is it's uh, very big and very bitter, so it's not accepted by the young children. Astellas was a key member of the consortium because Astellas developed the formulation. Praziquantel has two issues. Astellas has two issues. Astellas has two issues. そして苦味の抑制にも成功しました。アフリカの環境に合わせてアフリカの子どもたちが水なしに飲めるように速やかに崩壊するような錠剤を設計しました。またアフリカで高温体質の環境下でも保存できるように安定性に優れた錠剤
to pay for the drug or the mother to pay for the drug uh, in these remote and poor areas. So we need funders, we need international community to, to support us. Partnerships are central uh, to ensuring that we achieve our objective. It is actually the key to the future. It is the key to the success of NTD programs. Okay, okay, so I think a round of applause for that. And I know that the uh, that video was uh, put together by the communications team there, the senior director there, Bumpei Tamamara, who's joined us actually as, a, as a, in this uh, as part of the participants. A uh, fantastic example of looking at what's needed by the communities and reacting to that. Uh, and I think this pediatric uh, reform, the, the, the reformulated Kazakh Kantel, uh, will go a long way in terms of uh, attacking the disease, lowering the disease burden for schisto in endemic regions. Um, so a fantastic um, video there to show what's possible uh, in that. I think that's a good place to, for me to stop and hand over to Dr. Orabe, which uh, and, and, and launch the presentation. So Dr. Orabe, if you could just join us back on, uh, that would be great. And I'll mute myself. Well, thank you very much for SNTD for allowing us to um, speak today. And you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for everyone uh, who's joining um, um, this webinar today. Um, so um, I guess uh, I, I will start. Uh, of course, my name is Hayato, and uh, as, I, as I introduced um, today's um, talk, we, we've uh, titled it as a research and development uh, for impact. Um, and we think that uh, medicine is value valueless uh, without access and only valuable with it. So JHIT invests in R&D and we do not invest in access activities, so, uh, so to speak, but access we believe is an important aspect that completes the R&D continuum to create impact. So we, we pay close attention to how we strategize um, access activities. So first I will start off with uh, why and how we have formed, and then I will get into how we operate, uh, starting off with where we have received our funds and how we disperse our funds, uh, including um, how we our process of our, um, our request for proposals or RFPs. And then I will pass on to my colleague Isaac uh, to elaborate a little on GHIT's uh, position in access and how we envision R&D eventually um, connecting to patients. So it all started with this cycle of innovation, the disease that's endemic, and there's the demand for better medicine, vaccines, or diagnostics from consumer sites, but there isn't much that the developers could do with the limited resources, capacities, or maybe incentives uh, with developing, de development processes being very lengthy and costly for me medicines or vaccines or uh, diagnostics. So this is where we, we come in for product development, the more colorful cycle that you see on the right, uh, where you see on the bottom right, uh, um, at the bottom investment, this is where GHIT will come in, where we would inject some funding, which would allow this uh, product development cycle to kickstart uh, in order to, uh, for these uh, new products to be made, to put money into R&D and then product and then kicking off this, um, this cycle. So where did we start? Yes. Back in 2013, GHIT was launched as an international public and private partnership. And the picture above is an initial conception of the model drawn around a year before 2013 to try to kickstart the global health R&D by aggregating resources from multiple sectors. You can kind of see the scribble here, 50% from the government, and then you see BMGF, the Gates Foundation, and then the pharmaceutical companies. I will get into that later uh, in terms of the breakdown of our funds, but this is our initial concept model that came out that was done on the back of an envelope or back of a paper napkin um, on a, in a soba restaurant in, in, in Japan. And then 
the uniqueness where our uniqueness comes in is the from the fact that we leverage Japanese innovation technology and academia in collaboration with uh, global uh, partners and also the last point at that time uh, the initial scope was set to be for TB malaria and neglected tropical diseases now how we operate GHIT's business model into different four sections innovative financing as I said it is partly by three different main uh, combination of three different types of funders and then uh, as I mentioned international open innovation R&D basically a partnership between Japan and overseas and reverse investment portfolio management this is just to mean that uh, we make our investment we call it investments because uh, because it is uh, we monitor the programs or the, our invest or our grants that we give out very rigorously and we keep them on a uh, milestone based and we actually make sure that the programs would go go forward uh, so that we can keep on putting pressure on to ensure that the product makes it to the patient in a very timely manner. So that's the third part with the rigorous investment portfolio management. And then, of course, uh, in terms of access, Isaac will mention later, but especially for later stage programs or clinical stage programs, as they are entering or as they have entered the clinical trials, we ensure that the investees or the grantees have planned well in ahead with respect to aspects such as TPPs or manufacturing, regulatory strategy or financing strategy, et cetera, in order to make sure that the product that is being developed are actually on the way to making it to those people who are in need. With regards to the funding partners, this is just a breakdown. As I said, 50% is funded by the Japanese government, both from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of uh, of health, labor, and welfare, and uh, UNDP, and full partners uh, coming from the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, the found founders uh, on the 25% being contributed by those two foundations, and the rest of 25% uh, coming from both Japanese and global pharmaceutical and um, diagnostics companies. And we do have other sponsors such as such as ANA, uh, Mori, Morrison Foster, Salesforce, Yahoo Japan, and BCW as well, just uh, as, a, as, as a way to help us um, achieve our goals. And we have committed capital of $345 million of cumulative committed capital up until 20, end of 2022. And so far, we have invested uh, $229 million over 97 uh, different partnerships as of March 2020. Investments to date, uh, you can see the breakdowns of our investments. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we invest in malaria, TB, and NTDs, malaria covering 41.5% of our Investments, tuberculosis, 11.2%, NTDs, uh, which is plays the most significant part of our investment, is covering 47.2% of our investments. In terms of interventions, you see in the middle, we invest in drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. Diagnostics number is small, but we're increasing the contributions there. Um, so we do, we do actually see more and more programs coming into diagnostics as well. In terms of development stages, we do cover everything from um, discovery all the way to clinical stages. This is GHIT's current portfolio. Um, this is very small. You can see you can see that uh, we have many programs that are currently being funded. If you can record, you will be able to see it online. Um, but all the details of how much we have funded, all the details of the programs are all on our website and we welcome you to um, take a look. This is just to give you a sense that we invest everything from discovery all the way to clinical, from malaria, TB, and um, NTDs. 
Jihit, we invest in all the different partnerships, all from Japan and overseas partnerships. You can see all the institutions that have, we have uh, worked with. Uh, so far, we have invested in over 85, over 80 non-Japanese organizations and over 50 Japanese organizations um, in the field of uh, global health. For, uh, we currently have four clinical candidates um, that have advanced uh, into clinical stages. Uh, just to capture a few, you've, you've seen the Prazi Quantel, uh, the video, and you'll see another video um, after our talk. Um, but uh, just to give you a, a little sense from the top, CPGD35 is a lysmoniasis drug. It's an immunomodulator entering phase one in UK. It's a partnership between University of Tokyo, Ajinomoto Biopharma, Gene Design, and DNDI. Uh, one at the bottom, E1224, is an ongoing phase two trial in Sudan for phosphorobiconazole, and that's all based antifungal. It's a program in collaboration between ASI and DNDI. Um, PZQ, you've seen, it's an ongoing phase three trial in Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, this is an international consortium, including um, both Estellas and Merck. And uh, on the bottom, uh, where it says TBD, TBD just basically means that the final product's name is not decided, but it's a recently awarded schistosomiasis diagnostics program um, between Nagasaki University, Merck, Fine from Geneva, and uh, Leiden University. Just to give you a little sense on the the funding process uh, that we have for those of you who might be interested in uh, applying to JIHIT, um, typically our funding cycle runs in a, a nine to ten months cycle from where we release the request for proposals, where it includes the information of the uh, scope or the you know, what we're looking for in terms of the uh, our request for proposal, what, what we're open to. And then you would have about one month to respond uh, for an intent to apply, where you're intending to apply, then, then we will check the eligibility. Then you will have the full proposal to submit. And, you will and we will have several months of review and different selection processes. We have the external reviewers, we have the selection committee reviewers, and then we have the board reviews. And you will, uh, if you get awarded, then you'll go on to uh, signing investment agreements and then where we would disperse the uh, investment or the grants. And uh, some of the selected key requirements uh, for, for these uh, proposals that we receive, uh, we're open twice a year for this um, request for proposals, but uh, we're, we have to ensure that the uh, the proposal that we receive are in alignment with the scope of the request for proposal, as well as the target product profiles that are being out there. We also take into obviously account of the scientific merits of the team or merits of the research, uh, as well as the um, impact of the um, of the research that it's been undertaken. And as a very uh, stringent requirement we have is that the partnership between Japan and outside Japan. So you have to uh, you have to have a partner that is from Japan as well as a partner from overseas. So we we, we try to ensure that uh, this international collaboration is uh, is uh, included in, in each uh, proposal. I don't know, and um, in terms of co-funding, as you've seen the uh, the PZQ video as well. Uh, for late stage programs, we would look for uh, co-funding from other sources. For the PZQ program, you, you saw that it was funded um, also by EDCTP. Co-funding was received from EDCTP as well. And uh, we would look for ways to try to find other funders who would be interested in uh, getting the funding. And uh, because we're limited funders, um, we would always look for other opportunity to opportunities to get funding from other institutions as well. And then the final point is the launch strategy. Uh, basically means that for late stage programs, we would like to see um, detailed 
plans as to see how they are envisioning the program or when the product is being developed, how they're envisioning to move into um, access and delivery um, strategies so that we, we ensure that the plans are actually there to reach the patients. And with regards to our upcoming request for proposals, for those of you who might be interested in applying, uh, we, we just closed our last round of uh, request for proposals uh, several weeks ago. And we'll have another one that's open uh, May, June timeframe 2021, tentatively. So if you if you're interested, um, please do sign up on our newsletter and then you will you'll you'll receive uh, timely information on the um, information of the request for proposals. So we have proposals. We can um, you have you can submit proposals, everything from discovery in all the way to uh, late stage up on to uh, up to registration. That's that's our current scope that uh, we have open. Um, so um, please do check our website, and if you have any questions, um, uh, please um, do not hesitate to um, email us. Um, so with that, um, I will pass over to my um, colleague Isaac, uh, who is going to give you a little bit more insights as to the access and uh, GHIT's access strategies, etc. So Isaac, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Hayato. Um, and thank you very much to the ISNTD uh, for inviting us to do this presentation. So we've been uh, discussing a lot about uh, research and development, which is uh, indeed the, the, the core function of GHIT. As uh, illustrated in this uh, diagram, the blue section is where GHIT is mostly involved. But of course, uh, even though this is our focus, we, we have a vested interest in making sure that the products that we fund actually make it to, to, to delivery to the patients because that's where the, the impact we've been talking about is. So if you look at the, uh, this diagram, uh, we, we call it the, the access value chain. You, the, the first thing we consider at GHIT is that you can't actually separate R&D from access. It's, it's really one continuum as has been mentioned by, by Hayato. And the, the moment you start separating them, you, you have the problems that we're facing now where a product goes all the way to the finish line and then you start running around looking for super cold chain. I will not mention the name of the products, but you know this is something that we're actually currently facing now. So, uh, and some people will say this is like, uh, uh, you know, different sides of the same coin. So you can't really separate. And this is the view we have at GHIT that even though our focus is on research and development, we do. Uh, we we don't put uh, financial resources into access, but we do put a lot of effort uh, into the access component, either by directly working with our uh, grantees or with other multiple global access stakeholders. And then another important factor that we 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 consider in the R and D section is that we we plan ahead. Uh, as mentioned already, sometimes it could be too late to start thinking about access if you don't really plan ahead in the uh, in the R and D. So we work very closely with our grantees, our product development partners, to ensure that they have all the access considerations very early on in the R and D process, so that we we don't really run into surprises towards the end. And for for late stage products, we actually go a step further and ask the the grantees to produce a launch strategy and access plan, uh, which showcases you know, their regulatory plans, their manufacturing plans, uh, their procurement and supply, and the last mile delivery. And this is where we support them, where in areas, if we notice that there are areas that could be done differently or could be done uh, uh, with other stakeholders, this is where we support the, the product developers, the development partners, uh, by linking them up with other multiple global, I, I'll develop, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more later about how we actually do the, the linking of the development partners to other access stakeholders. And uh, the other thing we look at again at GHIT, if you, for those of you who are involved in the, in, in the access world, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the four A principles of access. Some people now add quality and sustainability to this, but for for today, for the sake of today's presentation, we'll talk just about the four A's. 
which is about availability, acceptability, accessibility, and affordability. Uh, if you look at this and you juxta, juxtapose this on the uh, access value chain, you, you notice that when we talk about availability and acceptability, this is what research and development is all about. You do research and development to make products available. Uh, and in cases where you have products available, sometimes they're not necessarily acceptable. You might have seen this in the, or, or suitable. You might have seen this in the video that was presented uh, on pediatric prosequanto. The use of prosequanto for the treatment of schistosomiasis has been going on for decades, but it was leaving out a particular subgroup of, uh, of the community, which is the preschool age children from below the age of six. So by doing research and development uh, with our partners, we will be able to make pediatric prosequanto acceptable, more suitable to that population. So really, again, you see that already the, the principles of access are closely linked to R&D and by already getting involved in, uh, you know, in research and development, you're already on the way to, to, to access. And then when you talk of accessibility, this is where I was saying we, we work very closely with our product development partners to make sure that they have all the access uh, consideration in place at that point. And just to give an example of the, the issue of the cold chain, uh, if you're already doing research and development and you realize that your product is going to require cold chain, even though it might not be uh, in your interest, or you might not have the capacity to develop uh, a different product that does not require cold chain. Probably at that point, that's when uh, a product developer could trigger pa parallel research and development uh, into maybe alternative cold chain pathways that will aid in the delivery of the product. Uh, and this is actually very important uh, for, for GHIT because this this uh, one of the principles of uh, founding principles of GHIT is open uh, open research and collaborative research. So even if a product developer is not interested in developing uh, technologies that will make their product more accessible, uh, by collaborating openly, uh, it is possible to to have other people develop uh, support uh, technologies, so to speak, that could make uh, a product in R&D uh, pass through this pathway much more smoothly. And of course, when it comes to affordability, this is always, uh, a, again, if you go online, you see in the GHIT, uh, in the GHIT access policy, we have a, a no loss, no gain policy. Uh, but of course, because we are in the, inter we're in the business of uh, stimulating innovation, we, we would like to encourage innovators and product developers uh, uh, it's very difficult to encourage people to do pro bono work, so to speak. So there has to be some uh, margin of gain or some money, margin of profit. It's just a question of negotiating uh, uh, how much that margin is to enable access. Uh, but the good thing for, for GIT, most of the products that we fund are uh, for public health interests and most of the, the grantees or the applicants already have that in mind. So up to now, uh, touch wood we haven't had really any issues with affordability uh, but in cases where you know a product developer has really tried everything possible to to make uh, to, again to to make the product as affordable as possible during the uh, r d process and the, if the product is still not acceptable or affordable enough then again this is where the other global stakeholders come in and this is one of the roles of GIT in uh, linking the product development partners with such partners who could aid in the affordability. So when we talk of uh, research and development for impact, really the, the, we summarize it, it, it has to be, R&D should be a continuum from innovation to delivery. You should think ahead, as uh, Hayato has already uh, uh, mentioned, innovation with, without access is valueless. So already at that point, when you're doing the innovation and the R&D, you should already be thinking about uh, the access and of course the r d has to be needs driven and this is something that we we do at jhit we, we work very closely with the who ntd department and with the various other uh researchers and innovators to to really understand what the needs are we've been close closely monitoring the uh, following the development of the new roadmap to really see how we can tailor the r d 
at GHIT to really be able to answer and deliver on some of the, the, the needs of the, the roadmap. And of course, uh, as mentioned, the access R&D should have all the necessary access and delivery consideration right from the beginning, uh, which is really planning ahead. And this is just uh, another diagram which summarizes what I've just been saying. So for GHIT, uh, our focus is mostly on the, this light blue section uh, where we invest directly into product development, but we do put a lot of efforts uh, through networking, leveraging our funding, um, uh, catalyzing discussions and uh, partnerships to really create strategic partnerships for, for access. How we actually do this is further illustrated in this uh, diagram. And the, the, you know, the, the, the organizations you see here are just uh, examples of the, the, the partners we work with. Uh, there are a lot more partners that we, we work with. So we have two uh, strategies, if I may uh, simplify it. So on one hand, we have a very product specific strategy where we work with the product development partners, uh, for example, the Pediatric Prasequantil Consortium, and really support them with the development of their product launch strategies. As I mentioned earlier on, we, we, we require, uh, for products that are in late stages of development, we require that the partners present a launch strategy. And then we, we support them in really making sure that all the the steps like for manufacturing regulatory are in place before uh, we get to launch and then on another hand we have uh, the global strategy where we, we still work with those uh, very product specific partners but on a more global uh, stage uh, with uh, other multiple partners as illustrated in that diagram uh, to really look at issues on a more holistic uh, not just product specific uh, 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 lens, because it, this is not just about GHIT, this is not just about GHIT funded products, but the idea is to have mechanisms and systems in place that will allow for any technology to really go through that access value chain as smoothly as possible. If GHIT uh, products are going to benefit from that or are going to demonstrate or illustrate the practicality of that, then this is where there is that direct link with the GHIT funded uh, products. So uh, this is how GHIT actually invests uh, in access. Uh, it's really to ensure a smooth transition of the GHIT funded products, but to also demonstrate what is possible instead of uh, what is possible uh, in terms of uh, access pathways for, for health technologies. So just to, for me to, to finish, my, my presentation was very short. I'll leave you with, uh, with this quote about if you want to go fast, you can go alone. If you want to go further, you go together. This really, again, touches on the collaborative uh, spirit and uh, open research that GHIT uh, encompasses. And this is going to be critical for neglected tropical disease because this is an area that is normally considered uh, non-profitable uh, by, by uh, innovators and product developers. So it will be very difficult to, to go it alone. In this case, we need uh, partners to come together uh, on the research and development uh, fund. And GHIT can catalyze, uh, GHIT can incentivize, uh, and GHIT can also participate in the formation of the strategic partnerships for access. And that's the only way we can deliver on, the, on what is needed to be able to deal with the with the uh, pandemic of neglected tropical diseases. I'll stop there for now, and then uh, maybe we uh, can entertain some questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Urabe, and to Isaac there in terms of the, a tale of two halves, uh, the mechanics of the fund, how to apply to that fund, and also their strategic considerations. And this whole issue of access is one of the, the most uh, quoted terms and concepts of this past year and I'm sure it's going to give a lot of Q&A. We've got some questions ourselves to put forward to you um, at the Q&A session but I'd just like to say thank you very very much. Amazing to see uh, how something that started on the back of a piece of paper in a sober restaurant, I love that little photo there, has uh, turned into something with so many partners um, you know, a, a runaway success story, frankly, and really demonstrating progress through partnership in terms of what's actually possible. 
Um, one of the portfolio um, uh, projects that you showed, I think it was Dr. Arabe mentioned the mycetoma work that you're doing. And I know that you've got a video here on mycetoma. So before we go to the q and I'd like to play that. Um, and, you know, it's a very recent addition to the uh, NTD schedule at the WHO following quite a lot of lobbying and advocacy. We ourselves put out a, a landscaping report uh, a few years ago now, and all of the various advocacy uh, campaigns, and you know, the DNDI were very active in this as well, uh, resulted in a win where that was added to the NTD schedule. And I, know, and I think recently a PRV voucher may have also been um, uh, awarded uh, the priority review voucher for funding, uh, you know, uh, treatments within mycetoma. But um, certainly, I know you guys have got something there. I'm just going to play the video. All these patients, silent, no legs, no feet, monstrous lesions, you feel like crying when you see them. Mycetoma, the silent killer, is a unique neglected tropical disease caused by a substantial number of microorganisms, fungal or bacterial. The fungal form of the disease still has very low cure rates, just about 20% or so. It often requires surgery, and the surgery is often then leading to a loss of a limb and, and a lot of morbidity. This is wrong. This is an infectious disease. An infectious disease should be treated with medication. The challenges are everywhere, everywhere. The good news that mycetoma now, it is one of the neglected diseases recognized by WHO. JHET in Japan was the first organization to support the research on mycetoma. This is a study that we are conducting in partnerships with ESI, who is providing us all the treatment of phosphavuconazole for the clinical trial. Mycetoma in this case, the treatment is not very strong, but the effects are strong. The treatment is we need to work together globally, different countries, trying to help the mastoma patients around the globe. Because the problem is the same in different parts of the world, the same patients, the same suffering, and the same socio-economic status. We need this community, we need these partnerships to provide some solutions and get some hope for these, uh, for these patients. So with a new treatment, what we hope is that we would not see these horrible lesions anymore. <laughs> we would see smiles again on these faces. Okay, so I think another round of applause for a fantastic, uh, thought-provoking video there, highlighting a very neglected, uh, neglected tropical disease, mycetoma. Uh, we ourselves are looking forward to the 11th of February. I thought I'd just mention this, where there's a disease called Noma, which is affecting the uh, Sahel area of Africa. It's a polymicrobial infection, uh, results in massive deformities in the uh, in the facial area. Um, subcutaneous tissue breakdown. Uh, we're, we're running a very special um, day, a NOMA day with the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, on the 11th of Feb. So we're fully aware of uh, this kind of, of the, the lack of awareness in terms of certain diseases and what that can result in. So hat, round of applause and hats off for having this um, within your portfolio and your focus um, area. So, so much to unpack from the, uh, the videos that you showed us. For us, access is the, well, obviously the key uh, issue, and we've really seen it grow in terms of its importance over the past, let's say, we've been, this is our ninth year of existence as the ISNTD. When we first started, 
MDA programs, mass drug administration programs, are very much prescription, uh, but you know, top down. And we've seen just that process in itself evolve by involving communities and redefining access and redefining the structures within MDAs. So it's very interesting to see this from an R&D perspective. Um, you've mentioned the four A's, availability, acceptability, uh, the, affordability, uh, the, the 4A model of, uh, of all of this. And what I wanted to ask you was, how early on into the R&D processes are these access considerations being taken by GHIT in your, from your strategic perspective? The voice of the community, how early on in your processes does that happen? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll have a first shot and then uh, Hayato could add. I, I think uh, the, 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 the question of how early is, is not just uh, for, for GHIT. And uh, probably the challenge for GHIT is that we don't directly engage with the community. We engage with our grantees who in turn engage with the community uh, because we, we fund the grantees. So in the discussions that we have, um, as Hayato mentioned, we, we, we really, you know, there's a long review process, uh, you know, involving multiple stakeholders from external reviewers. And one of the things that we look at is the impact mm -hmm. of, of the research of the product development. And uh, in that impact, uh, if there is a, co um, there should be a community element and really it is uh, th this is where we come in uh, and really try to support i mean it is not a showstopper if it's not in the you know in the application but as we move forward this is one of the things that we really work with our grantees to ensure that you know all the relevant stakeholders are engaged even though we don't do the engagement itself but we do mm -hmm. facilitate and catalyze those kind of discussions uh, and so of course if you look at r d itself you know, the, the earlier you are in the development stage, the more complicated it is to really talk about uh, community engagement. But then uh, if you also look at the TPPs, the TPPs are already created with the community consultations. So really we bring these TPPs again to the product developer to say, this is what is required. So at that point, community engagement has already been uh, considered cool. but probably not by g yeah okay fantastic but, uh, yeah. you can add uh... yeah yeah um so yeah i guess you, you mentioned both of it i guess of course tpp if, um at the time of application is would be would be needed so um as we said we we invest everything from discovery all the way to launch if you say launch is t equals zero um t minus five minus seven years hmm. before the we probably, if you want some numbers, yeah. uh, at the very least, we want those factors to start to be considered in order to have a uh, timely launch with the strategies uh, that um, comes after. I think that's very encouraging to hear that. Um, I think you've rightfully, Isaac, mentioned this uh, uh, the minus 80 degree cold chain issue with the, with the uh, COVID. It's highlighted what can go wrong, I suppose. Even though it's a success story, I'm not going to mention the, the name either, but, you know, that, that kind of thing can lead to ill feeling in those countries, in those communities that may feel that no one's looked at this. We need this. No one's considered this. And so that can have a knock on effect downstream. So I think it's absolutely vital and very encouraging to hear both of your responses to that. Um, in terms of the, the, let's say, affordability A, how much of that do you think, and it's a separate question, is linked to manufacturing? And I ask that because you've got UNDP as one of your partners. I know that you, you know, your access is through the partners and their recommendations. And I know that UNDP have been pushing for uh, manufacturing to be taking place in endemic regions for some time. Dr. Alistair West of the UNDP springs to mind. Um, but how much of that do you think is linked in the future to manufacturing happening there as a consideration for affordability? You, you know, you've invested in something. Can it be made there or not? How much of that is going to influence your decision? You know, and that's a question to both of you, I guess. Or we can start with, with Dr. Orabe, perhaps, uh, potentially. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I'll start. Um, so I think um, what, what's important, I think, of course, what you said, manufacturing uh, is going to be a key component for um, for the price to be to be right. I think what we what we would need to consider, I think the the four A's were mentioned, but I think we have to uh, also include sustainability yeah. in, in terms of how the product is going to be delivered in in local context. You know, maybe if uh, if a product gets made, uh, you know, for the first three years, the price is low. Yeah. And then after that, the price goes up, then it's not going to be sustainable anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to have that long-term perspective of having that uh, sustainability aspect to be addressed uh, relatively early on in the stage, in addition to the uh, four A's that, um, that have been mentioned um, by Isaac. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah. Thank you for that. Isaac, any, any spin on that? Yeah, if, if I may add, I think that the, you, you mentioned uh, that UNB, UNDP has been pushing for manufacturing to be done on, 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 you know, in the, on the ground, so to speak. And this is not just UNDP, but this is also something that we, we, we push for at GHIT because it is a way of reducing the, the cost of uh, you know, if you can lower the cost of manufacturing, hopefully that can have an impact on the final, you know, cost of the, the the product. So again, we work with our product development partners to to see how this can be done, and we 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 actually have success stories where, you know, partners have initiated themselves, and we have supported them to transfer uh, the manufacturing from uh, high cost countries to a low cost countries with significant significant impact on the you know on the on the price unfortunately this is not for mm -hmm. this is not for ntds uh, but mm -hmm. again it's the same principles yeah. uh, that we're really pushing for ntds as well and Absolutely. when it comes to ntds because again it's you know there are 20 ntds we're talking about and each one has a very small market so again if we can have like low cost manufacturing where probably one or two companies can manufacture maybe more than one of the products that could also you know improve the 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 the, yeah. the, the supply system because then you know the, there's the volume that companies look at exactly. so again those, those are some of the things that we're really pushing in, in our in, in that global strategy uh, yeah. that i presented about yeah I think hats off to both of you and the GHIT Fund in, in, in overall terms it's very encouraging to hear that that kind of a response in terms of sustainability, I know you didn't put it on your slides, but you did mention it as something that is definitely there uh, when, you, when you were speaking, Isaac, and we just talked about it. Either, either side of sustainability, one could argue that knowledge transfer is key to that, you know, to driving that sustainability curve. You've got Japanese excellence in terms of academic excellence, um, you know, the University of Nagasaki, multiplexing, diagnostics, micro B technology. You've got Takeda, you've got Astellas, as mentioned, Isai, a whole host of expertise, whole spectrum of it. How much of your processes do you think, and I'm talking about the future, really, let's say the next five years, how much of your uh investments or, or you know backing will go into knowledge transfer to drive that sustainability somewhat again i'll ask dr urabe first and then if <laughs> okay um well of course um whenever we we get the uh whenever we give out investments let's say for later stage programs and and, and when you when you talk about sustainability how much of the uh, of our the grants that we give out, how much of that uh, uh, the investment would actually stick into yeah. the country so that they can continue to yeah. build? I think there are two two aspects. I think one is uh, our direct in investments into late stage programs. There are some programs where we invest also in uh, let's say good clinical practice mm. uh, as part of the clinical trials. It's not to say we're doing that just specifically for capacity building but in order for the clinical trials to be run right uh, we, yeah. we make sure that some of the uh, good clinical practice is being um, done at the local site which which would be something that would um, cause a more sustainable development for any future drugs you know whoever is going to come to that location to 
run mm -hmm. clinical trials. So there, there are some learning aspects to that. The second aspect is um, uh, exactly what you mentioned with uh, UNDP. Mm -hmm. uh, UNDP, they have offices everywhere and they do have their, um, as part of their access and delivery partnership, they do a lot of um, capacity building work and pharmacovigilance work. Um, so we collaborate with them um, so that uh, um, some of our work will translate into getting the uh, products uh, sustainably incorporated into those respective countries. Thank you for that. Brilliant. Isaac, would you like to add anything to that? Or oh, That was a brilliant answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, as you mentioned, it was a brilliant answer. I don't want yeah. to dilute it. <laughs> That's great. And it's very encouraging to hear that, heartwarming to hear that, because it is going to take that extra mile. It's not just a static fund we're talking about. We're talking about embracing the communities, embracing their actual gaps and needs. I think exemplified by this, uh, the pediatric Hazigwantel, the need that was identified and then acted upon, you know, fantastic story there. Um, and we ourselves run a separate series of webinars with the Global Schistosomosis Alliance, the GSA, with people like Merck involved in that in terms of the, the formulators, the reformulators of Prasaquantel. So it's a fantastic story and it just shows what can be done. Um, if it's okay with both of you, I'm going to move to some questions from our wonderful participants, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, we've been joined by uh, Dr. Mario Guaivia from the Institute of National Health in Portugal. We've got uh, Stephen Bramia, Dr. Bramia from the Arthropod Vector Control, the consultancy runs in Canada. Uh, we're getting lots of different people joining. So I'm just scrolling through and just getting to a question here. Um, so Dr. Bramia is asking, would, uh, referring back to the uh, pediatric Praziquantel, would a sweetener affect the formulation and effectiveness of the tablets? The sweetener might make it more tolerable to children. I mean, is that it's a part of a question? Um, so I don't know if that's is that too technical. Other people have answered that um, in terms of the chat. Dr. Eli Korani Lefot, who was actually first in that video that you showed, uh, has said that. Syrups are not usually recommended for hot and humid conditions because of stability issues. Um, I mean, you know, the, the addition of a sweetener, is that some, that's an obvious, um, how to put it, compliance, answering a compliance issue, making it more accessible, uh, acceptable rather to, to the uh, preschool age, the left behind community that you mentioned. So. I mean, that's that's something to, to think about. I'm just going to, uh, I'm scrolling through these. We've had Dr. Christy, Professor Christian Burry uh, from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Hi there, uh, Christian, because we, we've met before. Great to see you here. Um, he's on there as well. He's made a point. He's saying that Syrups, they're talking about syrups, are very heavy and fragile to transport, so suboptimal for remote areas. Again, trying to really look at the uh, appropriateness, I guess, of, of, a, of an intervention. We've had people from Palestine, Dr. Khalid Abu Ali, he joined us from there. Uh, one second, I hear some questions. Lots of people saying thank you both for a very informative presentation on the vital components around funding of drug development as well. So a lot of thanks as well to both of you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Brown is asking, what mechanisms are in place to get the benefit to get it to the what mechanisms are in place to get it to the beneficiaries of the drug research? I suppose supply chain, I, I'm assuming. I don't know what. Is that better answered to your partners, I suppose? Uh, so, sorry, uh, I, I, was, I was also trying to scroll from my end to see if I can understand that question yeah. uh, more. But uh, wh while we're thinking about that in the background, maybe I could ask uh, answer some of the questions uh, from Stephen, I guess, on the sweetener. We, yeah. we also have online Utah, who's uh, yeah. the, the head of the Pediatric Prasequenta Consortium. Yep. So hopefully my answer will be satisfactory to her. But I think uh, part of the research into this uh, new uh, molecule, uh, this new formulation is really about taste masking. 
so that it is suitable for children. Uh, so it is a uh, taste must, uh, yes, if that's uh, an answer. Uh, I, I mean, there, there are different ways of uh, masking a taste and probably doesn't necessarily always have to be about making it sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is taste must and it is suitable for, for children. I understand it. Uh, it is a strawberry flavor. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And did you did you poll the people there to find <laughs> if they like strawberry? <laughs> Are strawberries no. really in flavor? <laughs> no, actually, there there is uh, there are plans uh, ongoing for 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 doing that uh, 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 study uh, community assessment acceptability study as part of the research yeah i mean i'm so saying it was smile but it's very important yeah it's yeah no no it, it is really yeah, yeah preschool <laughs> uh you're talking about that particular group that's been left behind as it were it's a vital component will they take it will they be able to uh you know orally take this drug so yeah, that's a vital um point there yeah um and uh, i'm sorry yeah no, no. So I'm also made to understand by, by the chemists that uh, it's not always easy to to add these flavorings to, you know, to 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 medicine. So it is also a chemical process. So you have to do the balance about acceptability and also what is feasible, uh, depending mm -hmm. on the chemical reactions. So fantastic. Yeah. A lot of considerations to go through. So yeah, you're right, Dr. Jutta Reinhardt Rupp from the uh, Merck. Global Health Institute has joined us as well, and she said, thanks thanks to both of you for the great webinar and the videos. I'm proud to be part of the Prasi Pantel Consortium. So I just made a, a statement there, so that's fantastic that you just been able to join us there. Um, so, one second, uh, so if I can yeah, answer Stephen's question. Yeah, I'm just going through these, uh, just bringing these down a bit. Um, some of these are statements. Um, <clears throat> so there's so, also uh, a question from Stephen again on the generic uh, manufacturer. So again, without really going into the generic forms, because that's a very specific uh, uh, terminology. But one of the things that we've been talking about is really taking manufacturing to, you know, to to an area where it can make it cheaper. If it's generic, uh, that's something that we obviously encourage. But if it's a different form, maybe the you know the the the, uh, the innovator would go into a partnership with another manufacturing uh, manufacturer, let's say in Africa or in a low income country. Then mm -hmm. that's something that also we are really encouraging, and we we in constant negotiations with the different uh, partners uh, at GHIT. But again, it's not just about uh, therapeutics. You know that there is also diagnostics. So again, it's really getting that balance uh, on what is possible on the ground. If it if it will make it uh, cheaper or even easier in terms of logistics to transport, uh, th these are some of the discussions we regularly and constantly have with uh, our grantees. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we, we haven't really have had uh, many products. We are still a relatively young organization, so we haven't had really had many products that have gone to market. Uh, we're expecting probably the first two in the next two to three years, mm -hmm. and more and more of these issues will become, uh, you know, more relevant. We're also learning as we go, yeah. what is possible and what is not possible. Brilliant. We also had Dr. Beatrice Greco uh, from the Merck uh, Global Health Institute. I know uh, Dr. Greco had been saying very nice webinar. Thank you to both of you, and thank you so much for the continued support. Um, I know uh, Beatrice had been involved in diagnostics for Merck before, but also now innovative pathways to access. So a question I wanted to ask was, you've got a current balance of um, partners. You, you showed a very nice series of slides with your partners, and each of those partners has got their own kind of level of expertise that's attacking your, the uh, say, R&D kind of steps in terms of innovations, R&D, regulatory landscape access. As you move forward, access becomes, let's say, I mean, look at all the signs, access, delivery, it's going to become more and more heavy, uh, gravi uh, more gravity is more important attached to it. Um, how, how do you think that's going to affect your balance of partners? What type of new partners do you anticipate bringing on board, given that, from a strategic perspective? 
And is it reactive or is it pro-reactive on your part? You know. I, I think we, we for us it's actually proactive and we have already started uh, building on this. We, we our, our strategy on access is really to build the strategic partnerships for access. And as I mentioned, it's not just about GHIT products and it's not just about the current products. Yes, we will use the current products to 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 really illustrate and demonstrate the, you know this strategic partnership to show that it works. But the idea is to have systems in place that you know any future products uh, from GHIT or from any other developer can really go through to to get to the you know to the intended uh, intended beneficiaries. So really, we are very proactive. We have, that's why I said we don't necessarily put money into access, but we put a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And we really building the the partnership and the networks for this, and we're also learning from. I mean, there, there are success stories in other diseases, you know, in, in in TB, in HIV, and in NTDs. We're really building on that, and you know, building on that experience as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Isaac, for that, Dr. Orabe. But in terms just, of proactive, um, just to add add on to that, I think uh, I've just seen um, on Isaac's presentation about the bottom-up and uh, top-down approaches. I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, the top-down approaches, uh, when we try to address these uh, issues with these different partners, uh, we have established uh, uh, a new platform in collaboration with UNDP and Government of Japan. Last year, we kicked off something called Uniting Efforts for Innovation, Access, and Delivery. Uh, you're welcome to look at our yeah. website if you just uh, Google uniting efforts, GP or something, it would show up. But that's actually a platform where different stakeholders can um, coalesce and give opinions um, on this R&D, everything from R&D all the way to access. Mm -hmm. And uh, that platform's ultimate aim is to try to be, uh, at the end, disease agnostics or intervention agnostics in a way that if you were to try to uh, get information from that platform. If you follow the way the platform has been built in that particular uniting effort, then you will be able to make uh, a product without difficulty. Of course, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. it, there are intricacies on different products, different geographic locations, mm -hmm. everything. But it would be an information sharing mechanism where success stories would be shared, so that anyone who would have this new innovation or new technology coming in and trying to want to develop and to deliver to a particular location, we'll be able to learn from the um, learnings coming out. Of and you'll, you'll see some knowledge products on that. That's fantastic. Yeah. What, a great, what a great idea that is. There's a parallel there because we've seen the US FDA on a separate webinar that we did in a Connect. The FDA, with in conjunction with people like the DNDI, they've set up a system called Cure ID, which I'm sure you know about, which is they're looking for uh, just stories around free reformulations, even anthropological stories from the community that does this, this works in this setting, this is tried and tested here, it works. And from that, they gather and bringing that information together in this kind of knowledge share um, ethos to, to hopefully bring new products out. So that's a fantastic, um, that's really encouraging again to hear that. And I'm definitely going to check that out. Maybe there's a future webinar we could do around that. I think that's very exciting, actually, to hear that. That's brilliant. Um, I'm just trying to scroll and speak at the same time. Uh, Dr. Afdab Udin from the, uh, I think, Ministry of Health in Bangladesh, he's asking, is popular community dialogue approach, is the popular community dialogue approach applied for any project so far for community engagement? So I suppose one way is the information coming from the communities into R&D processes, but the other way is for the engagement of those communities, or is that something that you will, again, do through your partners? Yeah, uh, maybe I can answer to that. Uh, again, just to build up on the Uniting Efforts uh, webinar. So from a global perspective, this is a platform where communities we engage uh, with communities directly uh, and it's not really it's uh, disease agnostic it's really about the access barriers to you know not just ntds but the uniting efforts is uh, it focuses on neglected diseases globally not just neglected tropical disease so we have tb and malaria in there and uh, through the the annual meetings we have 
there are community representatives who come in and give the community perspectives but but of course it's i mean we, it's impossible to have all the different communities represented because each and every community has its own uniqueness but uh, i think on a broad stroke that the the principles of community engagement are represented from a global perspective and then more from a product um, you know, product specific community engagement. Uh, our partners so far that the ones we've been working with or on working with on late stage products, they, they have a lot of community engagement processes through the in their R and D. Uh, again, to give the example of the yeah. pediatric plastic quantum consortium, you you have asked the question: did, did you ask the community if they wanted this? So this is something mm -hmm. that the pediatric plastic quantum consortium is actually doing on the ground now. Yeah. So again, it's not really GHIT doing it on the forefront, but it's part of the funding yeah. from GHIT, then it's part of, of the that process. Yeah. That's fantastic, great answer there. Right, thank you for that, that's brilliant. Um, Stephen Bramia has come back to, basically he's asking, can the beneficiaries, and by that I'm assuming it means those communities or those countries, be allowed to manufacture cheaper generic forms of the drugs? So I suppose he's looking at it from an IP perspective, from an intellectual property uh, perspective. Uh, you you, you co-develop, you fund uh, something, it's got this IP wrapped around it. Is there a point where you open up the IP or is that not part of the model or? Horrible question, I guess, but it has to be. I suppose I, it's a good question. Not horrible, it's a good question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with regards to IP, of course, GHI doesn't um, hold the IP. Uh, so it's it's the it's owned by the partners, mm -hmm. first of all. That, that's one thing. But what we do request the partners is that uh, when someone else is going to make it, it's going to be royalty free. free. So basically, you know, you're not going to put you know big margins if someone else is going to make it. And and if a, if a generic form um, comes out, I guess uh, of course we, we do, and other thing we do is that what we call no loss, no gain policy. So whoever is going to be making is going to have mm -hmm. to uh, put down the price you know, that, that's close to the, um, the cogs. So if a, a generic company comes in, then it's going to be something that's going to be discussed with the, um, the partners, yeah. um, with the final decisions made, uh, maybe collectively, but uh, of course there, those, those are some of the rules that we, we have. But of course our intention is not to, and you want to really make money, but of course to help the um, patients who are in need to get it at the right price. So. Brilliant. Great answer again. Um, there are some statements coming through. So we have Dr. Anouk Gouvras, who helps to, she uh, runs the Global Schisto Alliance uh, based here in London. She's put a link there for all of the for all of you, which is a recording of a Connect seven webinar that we did earlier, uh, highlighting the Pediatric Prasequant Health Consortium work. That link goes directly to the webinar. We've got it on our website, on our YouTube channel as well, in case anybody wants to further knowledge on that. Um, she's also read, she's also saying, I've read the exciting announcement on the partnership to develop a rapid diagnostic test for Shisto with the <laughs> FIND Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, the Global and GHIT, um, as well as the Nagasaki University Institute of Tropical Medicine and Leiden University Medical Center. Um, LU, LUMC together with Merck. So, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff that you're involved in. And I think you've, you've really highlighted the interplay that needs to happen between the science um, and access itself. When we first spoke a week ago, Dr. Orabe, uh, you made me smile because your first statement was for, I asked you to define access. You said it's somewhere between science and art. I love that. I absolutely love that. That's a fantastic quote. Um, and it's really encouraging, it's really useful, and, and it gives you a sense that we will get to those 2030 goals, because that last mile is really going to be about somehow encapsulating the, the lived experience of the people, bringing it somehow into this. So I think that's fantastic, um, brilliant. Stephen Bramia is saying, from the lunch table, uh, 
to the to the labs and to the beneficiaries. Kudos to the Japanese scientists and funders. So you've got a big fan there with Dr. Brahmi in Canada. So <laughs> that's great. Um, I think he's referring to the Soba restaurant uh, picture in your presentation, which is fantastic. All great things start like this, so that's fantastic. Um, Dr. Afdabuddin is asking, can we have a recorded presentation later? Yes, uh, we're going to edit this um, uh, and get it out there in public domain on our YouTube channel. You're all absolutely free to use that link and, and use that in your own websites or however you want to do that. Uh, so that's we will be doing that after that. I'm wary of the time. It's quarter past two. I know we scheduled this for about an hour. Um, if there are no if there are no further questions, um, I'd like to say a huge thank you uh, to both of you uh, for joining late in the evening from Tokyo, Dr. Orabe, um, and from Geneva, so closer to us here in London, uh, Isaac. But fantastic. It was a great webinar. Thank you very, very much for your time. And I hope we stay in touch. And we'd like to see what else we could kind of have a look at. Um, and definitely say hi to Bumpei Tamawara. He's, <laughs> he's watching as well as he's logged on. But hello, Bumpei, as well to you. Uh, it's been a while. Um, Dr. Eli Korani Lefol, thank you so much for this excellent session. Thank you, ISNTD and the GHIT Fund. Everybody's hats off to you guys. It's fantastic, brilliant to see. Yeah, really encouraging. Thank you very much uh, you. to that. I hope you all stay safe. Yeah, and I hope we have uh, the chance to meet again. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, you. both of you. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, Thank everybody. You. Goodbye.